let's let's talk about things happening. We had uh, a perennial favorite movie star and a very beloved comedian get into, I won't even call it an altercation at the uh, recent Oscars here in 2022, but it certainly was for me a display of toxic masculinity for lack of a better word. Let's talk about what happened there. I'm not trying to pick on everybody, anybody. Everybody's piled on both sides, but there has to be some lessons and, and help us understand what happened that, that night. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's sad. It was a sad circumstance of what happened, but especially like with Will Smith. I love Will Smith. I, you're right. He's a wonderful actor, a great comedian. Uh, but but there are times that, again, we don't know all the circumstances of what's been going on in his life, in his world per se. But you could see it's a man who felt very insulted and disrespected. And what he did was, as opposed to taking that and being able to regulate his emotions at that moment, he let his emotions get the better of him. And therefore, then went and reacted in a way that, you know, 90% of the people who see it say completely unacceptable. Um, and rightfully so, at least in my opinion, also, because again, as a emotionally developed man, he should have been able to, again, regulate his mood to be able to say, okay, you know what, I'm not happy. And all he had to do was maybe make a gesture, you know, wave to him, whoa, 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 man, oh, you know, out of bounds, out of bounds, right. cool it, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. That would have been it. Then he could have went and addressed it with him later. And talked about it. But again, as I said, he got, and as, like I said, we don't know what was going on in his world that day, that week, what's been happening with him. But this is one of those times when, again, a man just snaps. He snapped, and right. He snapped. And that's unfortunate. And I don't think it can, taint, we can't taint the whole man completely right. and for his body of work. But we, but you do have to understand that. And he understands there are consequences to that action because, right. again, what's happened is that was on a stage. And I don't mean a little stage. I mean, Huge, global. Right, global. Right. And what have we seen since then? We're seeing all these little videos that are coming out of different people who are they're just slapping people. There's a, a amateur tennis ta uh, match that took place. And the loser that came to the net slapped the guy who won. I mean, and again, those those are things that people see and they start mimicking. And that that's the thing about he know he needed to understand he had great responsibility mm -hmm. it, with with the status that comes in his role of what he does in life. He has great responsibility. He has a role model, whether he likes it or not, but he does serve in that role uh, to be able for people to see and to be able to take good action versus bad actions. And we and we all do. We all have uh, that responsibility. Those of us who are doing anything in the public uh, or within our homes, it's somebody else is watching at all times. Now you say regulate his mood over his behavior. What What's the difference? I mean, I, I just, I kind of thought you just feel like you feel, but it's how you react to that. Right. You know, I think yeah. for me, you know, again, being a cognitive behavioral therapist, I believe it's the way we think that drives how we feel and then how we behave. So immediately, you know, Chris Rock, you know, tells the joke. He has a thought, Will has a quick little thought of some kind, like, hey, you're dissing my wife. But he you laughed. Know, he, uh, he, he did because I think I think that laugh was more of again that nervous type of reaction. Mm -hmm. It people wasn't sometimes, true. yeah. People laugh, ha ha ha, and then all of a sudden it's like whoa, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and it comes into oh, he's insulting her. Right at that point, okay, he now moves to his emotional state, mm -hmm. and the emotion is what is it? I've been disrespected. Mm -hmm. Okay, he he is trying to show me up, whatever he may have been feeling at that point. Right. And instead of taking that emotion, 
which is now starting to heighten, his anxiety is starting to increase, and be able to say, okay, wait, wait. We're in a very public forum, as you said. This is mm -hmm. being shown globally. You know, this is not the time or the place to demonstrate how upset I am. Mm -hmm. Let me slow everything down. And then what is the proper behavior? Okay. The proper behavior at that point is I could just, again, point out to him, hey, dude, not cool. Not cool. Right. Right. If you right. want to do that, or he could have just said, could have turned away with a look that indicated he wasn't happy. Right. But he didn't need to go to that extent. Instead, he's acting out of his emotion. He's not acting out of rational thinking. Okay. And that's where we have to turn. We have to move from our emotional state and we have to slow down and we move to our irrational thinking state. Because many times, the emotional state that we're dealing with is more of an adolescent thinking. What he did was adolescent thinking. Okay. okay. That was just a, a kid having a tantrum. Right. I don't Versus, care about the consequences. I don't care about anything else. I'm mad and I'm going to act on it. That's right. Versus, ooh, wait a second. You know what? This is not the form, not the time, not the play. There will be consequences. I do want to go up there. I feel like I want to smack them. I'm not going to do it. What the right choice to make? The right and choice. he didn't get there. Okay, your your work, your background. Uh, one of the things you talk about is the inner child model. Yes. Talk, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, I I believe that you know when it comes to addiction, there are three major components that can keep us locked in an addictive state. The first is one, unresolved childhood pain points. These are the things that have happened to us when we were younger, and that's where our inner child is. Okay? They could be things that are abusive, such as you know, physical abuse, you know, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, anything. Or it could be just it could be neglect. Okay, parents who are supposed to walk you through the steps of life to teach you how to be an emotional being or and also to be there for you, but they're not because they're distracted for whatever reason. And those are all childhood pain points that still haunt us today. The problem is we're oblivious to the fact that that's what's happening. Number two is our inability to sit with emotional distress. We just can't sit with it. Now, this is, again, something that we should be taught when we're younger. What do I do with these troubling emotions? How do I handle them in a healthy, effective way? Well, people who deal with addictive behavior can't sit with this emotional pain. So what they do is they learn at a very young age, a great coping mechanism is, I won't think about it. No. Well, how, how do you not think okay. about it? I have to distract myself. All right. Too much food, too much TV, too many video games. I, I just dive into things. And then we take it into our teen world and our adult world. Mm -hmm. And what some of those behaviors now become extremely destructive. As you start to get into alcohol, into drugs, even food, where people become obese because of it. So therefore I can't sit with that. And then the final aspect is the idea of being emotionally undeveloped, which means it, it makes it very difficult for me to really make rational decisions versus what I make are highly emotionally charged decisions like we saw Will Smith make right. and that, a couple of weeks ago. And that's why I made that. I didn't mean for that to be such an abrupt segue and transition. But when you mentioned the childlike behavior, it brought to mind the inner child model. Is there any type, I'm just throwing this out here. Is there any type of relationship or can anger be an addiction? Well, anger, 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 not an addiction, but Everything that I just pointed out to you mm -hmm. can, is one of the reasons why people can't control their anger. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. Because they have these unresolved pain points that are still triggered. And therefore, what they what I mean by triggering them is triggering the negative thoughts they have about themselves, such as I'm not respected, I don't belong, I'm not good enough, I don't measure up, nobody loves me. I mean, it's those kind of thoughts that we get triggered by. Now remember the big thing, Dr. Edson, I can't sit with the emotional distress. I have to take an action. And sometimes that action is I'm going to get aggressive. Got it. Because I want to shut it down. Right. Isn't that kind of a learned behavior though, or or partly the not being able to sit with the emotions that the get over it, stop crying, stop acting like a girl, all of that stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, this is when I go into the book and I talk about the fact that this is the neglect. This is when we're not taught to, to have to do the things we're supposed to do to learn how to be healthy, emotional beings. And there are different stages of childhood development that we're supposed to go through in order to help us emotionally bond and regulate our moods. Well, if somebody's not showing us how to do that, how do I ultimately do that? I don't. So therefore, I am emotionally you know, undeveloped. And then it gets passed from generation to generation because we don't have these skills. That is a great point. Okay. Because that's what happened. It because Mm -hmm. you know what? My parents can't teach me what they don't know. All right. They don't know how to regulate their mood. They don't know how to tune to others. They don't know how to show empathy. They don't know how to trust other people. And most importantly, they don't know how to sit with emotional distress. They're reactive. They're not responsive. Okay. And you're right. It's just a vicious cycle that goes from generation to generation to generation until somebody decides I'm going to break it. So how do we how do we break it early on? I mean, to you don't know what you don't know. If you've seen this for you know mom, grandma, great grandparents, granddad, or whatever, is it just you have to go on that journey of, of introspection take courses that, i mean how do you know that this is even going on i, I don't think people recognize they, they know that they're eating too much or drinking too much or sleeping too much but most of us don't even realize why how do you figure that out right that at the and that's why the word that probably appears in my book more often than not is oblivious you're right we are totally oblivious to all of it and usually what it takes if it takes someone else pointing it out to us Okay, a spouse or a friend or somebody to say, hey, you know what, you you are just so inwardly focused, you are just so hypersensitive to things you you don't, you lack curiosity when it comes to people, Mm. or it takes an event, a really life changing event, such as you are somebody who you have an alcohol problem, and then you wind up getting maybe a, a you know, getting arrested for Mm -hmm. drunk driving Uh, or, you know, you have a drug problem and, you know, you wind up maybe having your cloak to uh, being overdosed. You wind up still recovering, but still it's that type or you have a sex support or pornography addiction and you get caught. So it takes that life altering event to get people to somebody to say, wake up. But even then, they don't know what the problem is. So that way they need to be able to sit with a therapist to be able to say, okay, what's going on? Yeah. And, and then once they identify, realize, oh, you know what? I have this emo- low emotional IQ that's affecting many areas of my life and I need to go and have work done to address those. Okay. We, we started this uh, episode off talking about, and this is, we're, we're just doing a video for my uh, podcast, Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson, periodically when I have guests with some really great information they all do, but who are engaging as well. I like to, you know, record it and, and do a video part of it. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. It helps me connect as well. And we started out talking about, I I introduced you by, you know, broaching the subject of toxic masculinity. And I don't know if you saw the um, Oscars 
in an entirety or just the episode that they keep showing us. I'm looking on my phone so I can say this name right. But the uh, Jane Campion made Oscars history with The Power of the Dog, which is an incredible movie, Power of the Dog, for those who haven't seen it. She won the Best Director Academy Award. And in this is all the things that you're talking about. We have these two, two brothers that said in uh, New Zealand, I believe, ranchers. And one of them, I think what, what it brought out for me, which was so interesting, was that you're not all of anything because this, this one brother in particular, the main character who is just you know, verbally abusive, somewhat physically abusive. He also can be, you know, very kind and nurturing. And I'm wondering, is that part of what makes it difficult for people to recognize themselves? It's not like people totally turn off or disengage with them because you, you know, this part of them that's kind appeals to you. I even wonder if that's why women stay in relationships sometimes with uh, people and your work well, your book is largely about men. You haven't been using uh, pronouns and what you're saying applies to everyone, but that's why I'm, I'm referencing males. But just for people who are in a relationship is what I'm getting to with someone like this and they are oblivious and not listening to what you're trying to say to them. Rather than do something dramatic, is there another way to reach them, to, to make them aware? Yeah, it, first, first you address the thing about why men write the book about men. It because that's the population I work with. Mm -hmm. I work exclusively, uh, exclusively with men, I and I think it would be presumptuous of me to make the assumption of how do women deal with a lot of this. That's Although it. you're right, there's a, there are a lot of similarities, mm -hmm. but again, I don't have the data to be able to put that out there. But to answer your question, yes, you know what? You do see a time that these people can show their tender side. And that's what people start to gravitate to. And they say, because you're right, we're not all or nothing. Right. Right. We, we all have the capability to, to show both. And even the people who are very caring and loving and can regulate their emotion can lose it. Yes. Okay, they can have a moment. We've all had moments. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah, had a few too. moments. Right. <laughs> That's why I them. haven't piled on with Will Smith because I'm not not to that degree, but yeah. Thank you right. for saying that. That's true. <clears throat> but it is it is true. We all have the capability to mm -hmm. be able to hurt other people. And we need to be able to be aware of that and understand it. But even there, you're right, there are times when you can make the appeal to someone to say, look, you know what, I see the good in you. However, there's this other side that you can't seem to control and regulate. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to do something about it. You know what, until that person again, and I boy usually takes that moment or that event that happened where all of a sudden they wake up and say, I can no longer keep doing this. This is destructive for me and it is destructive for others. And unfortunately, you know, Dr. Anderson, some people never wake up. They never have that moment. And they just go through the rest of their lives living like that. We, we, uh, I know pornography addiction is, is a topic that you address, and I'm thinking about some of the data uh, I talked about with the previous guest, uh, Kelly Calabrese, about the divorce rates going up and, and pornography largely being a cause. You know, we always think about finances or, or communication, but what, what, what happened? Why, why has, I guess I want to understand what is the, how does the addiction go with pornography? What is going on with that when you're right there in the house with somebody? I just really don't understand. I'm asking yeah. this. <clears throat> well, I don't it, understand. We, we, we could sit here and talk five hours with this and maybe even five days, okay? But okay. let me see if I could try to condense it very quickly. First and foremost, the, the reason, and you're right, uh, there was a um, 
a survey that was done with attorneys, I think about five years ago, that mm -hmm. showed that nearly 50% of all divorces in the complaint mentioned pornography. Oh, wow. Yes, it is good. So you wonder what in the world is going on? It's the simple answer, accessibility. Mm. It's just too okay. easy to get a hold of. You sit here, I'm sitting at my computer, I could click on right now and I could ruin this whole you know, podcast. Okay, let's this whole webinar. <laughs> I don't want to, right, let's not do that. That's I, right. I understand. I've been on Instagram and just saw a little, you know, photo and clicked on it and all of a sudden I'm in a oh, uh, whole you're, thing you're, I wasn't trying to do and that's free I'm, I'm not even it's just there I'm like who is regulating I this I know you're just down a rabbit hole it's like where I don't want to be here and you got to come out but anyway right. it's just too easy and then go back to the unresolved childhood pain point okay I can't sit with pain so um, I need to distract myself so now the distraction even maybe just television or, you know, video games or that, it's pornography. Okay. And that's what they use to create this level of stimulation. And what happens over time, whenever we uh, engage in any type of pleasure enhancing or pleasurable uh, activity, a neurochemical called dopamine mm -hmm. increases in our brain. Okay. Okay. Dopamine it, it is a it's a good chemical. It helps. It's that feel good chemical. But when you're doing something like pornography on a regular basis, you are producing high levels of dopamine in the brain, and that is not healthy because what it does it winds up burning out the dopamine receptors. I don't want to get too technical here with everybody, but what it basically does it create this urge for more and more pornography. So that sounds so like there, crack or cocaine or it's something. The it, it's the same thing. Okay. Dr. Anderson, you're talking about the same thing here. That's what it is. Because what you're doing is you're messing with the neurochemicals of the brain. Wow. And that's the problem. So therefore, that's the addictive nature of it. At that point, what happens, people become um, reckless. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, oh, my wife's laying in bed and I'm on my phone doing this. I had a story. One of my clients, uh, you know, his wife actually reached out to me. She's mm -hmm. in the kitchen with her daughter, her uh, nine-year-old daughter, and they're like cooking, they're making cookies. And all of a sudden, through the sound system in the house, comes these sounds of, profanity of two people having very rough sex and 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 the little girl's like mommy turn it off turn it oh, off turn it off enough. she didn't know what to turn off she goes running up there and her husband's sitting in the bedroom watching porn on his phone and he's not even aware of the chaos not aware this that this happened so yeah. now this child has been exposed to something that they should never be exposed to especially at that kind of age and that's, that's just one of the many problems that what pornography causes in individuals, in relationships, as well as in society overall. Understood. Well, you, you explained it well. And, you know, I, my doctorate is in dental surgery. I'm a dentist. So if people are like, Dr. Mo, why is she acting surprised about this? This is not. <laughs> This is not my area. I can give you all kinds of data on third molars, but I, <laughs> I, have, a, <laughs> I have a natural curiosity. And of course, I'm familiar with, with dopamine, but right. the way that you just explained it, that there are actually, you know, neurochemical changes in your body because of this exposure, because we, we tend to think of it as a, a spiritual thing and, and just mm. a lack of trust, but that they're actually changes in the body that are impacted irreversibly or reversibly no, no, it, the brain just the wonderful thing about the brain and uh neuroplasticity is that the brain can really heal it could never really go back to its full you know capacity of what it was but we have pet scans that show that a person who watches pornography on a regular basis for numerous years if you look at that brain 
next to a PET scan of a brain of someone who's a heroin addict, they look very, very similar. Wow, I had no idea. I had no idea. Okay, last question on this topic, and we'll have to have you back, and we are going to go live next time. <laughs> we will have this all figured out. But for the women, our partners, whom whoever they might be, who are in relationships with someone who's addicted to pornography and in the stats you just said, uh, support what I've heard from previous experts, the, their reaction is he doesn't love me. And that's all they get out of it. You must not love me if you look at these other women or goats, ducks, I don't know what they're looking at, but right. you must right. not care about me. And from what you're saying that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. I'm, I'm not saying that behavior doesn't need to be dealt with, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're not loved. Or is that, did I draw yeah. the right conclusion? Oh, ab absolutely. But you know, if even the more devastating thought that the partner has is, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? Because you want that but not me, right. why do you need that? But the thing is this, and I, this might confuse a lot of people, but this is what it is. Pornography, person has a pornography addiction, it's not about sex, it's an intimacy disorder. See, wow. they've confused physical intimacy with emotional intimacy. Mm. They don't know how to be emotionally intimate and engaged. So they're always seeking out more and more different, actually, looking for different, looking for that, that, that image or that video that uh, like fulfills them from an emotional standpoint, and it doesn't happen. So they continue down that. And then as it continues to escalate, because mm -hmm. again, we reach levels of tolerance where now the brain says, oh, the amount of dopamine you're giving me is not enough. So mm -hmm. therefore, what was exciting yesterday is no longer exciting now. I need to go step up to something different or worse yet, I now just need to step outside of my marriage because I want to try some of this stuff. Right. Okay. And that's where it goes. So for women, they have to understand that this is not about them. Okay. If you had nothing to do with them, I could, as I tell the spouse, I said, I could replace you with any woman in the world mm. that he'd be married to, and he'd do the same thing. It okay. is not about you. I know it hurts, understand it hurts, not, yeah. but do not allow it to impact your self worth. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. Before we go, tell us about uh, strugglingmen.org and your therapy and, and how people can contact you. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, www.strugglingmen.org. That's the website there that people could learn more about the emotionally undeveloped man. Mm -hmm. uh, the book, Why Men Struggle to Love Overcoming Relational Blind Spot, that's available on Amazon, as well as Going Deeper, How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction. That's what we're talking about earlier. You can right. find that there. And I'll give you one more quick website. If they want to learn a lot more about the inner child and its impact, not just on sexual addiction, but on all our behaviors, they can go to www.innerchild-sexaddiction.com. Okay. Good. Excellent. Very good information. You've been a magnificent guest. And again, I appreciate your patience with me and the technical disorders. Hope we can have you back again and learn more about this fascinating topic. Good luck. I would love to be back. So thank you. I appreciate it.